Hi. I'm Rich. That's Anna. Hi. Hi, I'm Anna. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, uh, this is weird. We don't know what to do. Um, we we're recording this <laughs> weeks ahead of time. This is not how we planned on on this happening. Uh, but uh, the, we're gonna we're gonna try this out. See how this goes. Welcome to. We'd like to level with you about Node.js. Uh, yeah, I guess that slide means I should introduce myself. So, uh, like Rich, I am on the Node.js Technical Steering Committee. We both have been contributing to Node.js for a long time now. Uh, in my case, it's, uh, I think, four and a half years now. Rich, probably even a bit longer. Um, so, yeah, what? Uh, so I work for a company called Neoform and particular in the department called Neoform Research, which basically means I get to do uh, work on cool next generation Node.js features. And I'm Rich Trott. Uh, I, I work for the University of California in San Francisco in their library. Uh, I've been involved in Node Core since I think 2015. Uh, I don't wanna take credit for work I did not do, so I should point out that Anna did all of the slides except for this one and the next slide. Um, so, you know, more importantly, she also wrote most of this talk. So if there's anything technical and cool, it's probably because she came up with it. Um, so yeah, we're recording this ahead of time um, because of the COVID-19 pandemic. This is also in the midst of a lot of protest in the United States and, and beyond about uh, police brutality on black bodies. And uh, as we speak, uh, the Node.js website now looks like this uh, for one week. Uh, we have decided that uh, we would uh, have a list of black people who have been killed by police brutality. And it's just a really, really strange, surreal time to be sitting here with my friend Anna and recording this talk about, you know, it, feel, it feels a little bit like navel gazing about Node, but I hope you like it anyway. <laughs> So we go right from that to abrupt transition to happy birthday, no, at 11 years, wow. Yeah, so, so, so that slide refers to the first uh, release of Node. Uh, the Git log goes a bit, uh, goes a bit further uh, into the past, but this was the first release of Node and it's been a whole 11 years since then now. Yeah. Yeah, so we're here today to talk about what went well and what hasn't gone well. And uh, we'll talk about Dino a little bit, right? I'm pretty <laughs> sure. And yeah. uh, uh, you, you took a look at this, the 001 commit and like all the files are gone now or something? Yeah, yeah. So, so as the commit message says, it, it like fixed something to work on FreeBSD. Uh, in the build files and everything that the commit change is long gone by now. None of the files in there have existed for years, uh, which kind of like it, it shows that Node.js code, it's not the same as it was five or or more years ago, and certainly not eleven. So, so yeah, this is um, this is the contribution graph for Node um, because I'm a graphics design pro, I just took a <laughs> screenshot of the GitHub page and inverted it so it's dark, it fits into the dark team. Um, so anyway, lots and lots of things have happened uh, since the first release of Node. Um, the, the most significant uh, impact points are the ones that I've labeled here. Well, I, I wouldn't call Node 14 like significant particularly, but it is where we are right now. Um, and so, so some people might remember the zero to 10 time, that was a long time ago, but it was, it was, um, it was when lots of people got into Node.js in the first place. It was definitely during the hype phase. It was also that hype that got me into Node in the first place. Yeah. Some people might remember the IOGS fork, um, something that, that uh, grew out of, out, out of unhappiness with the governance model of Node and that, ultimately led to the to the governance structure that we have now when uh, when that fork IOGS was merged back into Node.js, it came with all new governance. It was no longer corporate back. Uh, and yeah, so so the, the time when that happened was the V4 release. That was the first post-merger release of, of Node. 
And, and that was kind of like when, what I think when modern node development started, not just because of the changed governance, but also, you know, um, we, we got some of the uh, ES6, I think, features yeah. that we can now use. Um, so the, the next thing on the timeline here is the, is the IOJS fork, um, which like it, it also grew out of uh, unhappiness with Node.js's governance. Um, and, and like, I don't know if you want to call it successful or not, but the, at the very least we did, I would say we did get some good governance changes out of that and definitely, uh, also worker threads where, you know, it, it kind of provided a green field to like play around with new ideas. Um, worker threads was definitely the main one that first got developed there. Yeah, and uh, then there's a big gap and we're at 14. <laughs> All right. And uh, I mean, there, there, like, there were some nice important things that happened since then, like, I don't know, the, the introduction of async await. Um, like we mentioned, the v 4 release was the first one that actually came with, you know, some of the things that you would consider modern JavaScript. Um, and, and it also had a very different governance model. And those things basically meant that, you know, the, the, the reason there are so many commits in that time was not, uh, because there were so many contributors, like they're like what the current situation is. Uh, it's more just like, you know, um, uh, work was done in a very, uh, I, I would call it like move fast and break things way. Uh, <laughs> people were just pushing commits to master and, you know, they were writing code that would now be considered legacy code. And that, that one was all fine for the time, I would say. Um, but it definitely kind of left us stuck with, with, you know, legacy code. So, so things that come from that time, uh, are, are all these streams versions, not just has three different versions of streams basically and they are all from that time um there's http1 the http mod p module that everybody uses and and in particularly the tls code and these are all things you know in the context of that time it makes made sense uh to just get something together that works uh and and you know kind of say if we want to uh make this a bit cleaner, we can do so later. And then <laughs> as, as so often that kind of didn't happen. So these are things that are like, that have not seen all that much change since that period. They are basically, I mean, they have been changed a lot, but the, the basic structure is still there. And, and that's kind of because, you know, we didn't have good encapsulation there, no symbols. Um, so basically everything was easily accessible from, from NPM modules, uh, no clean APIs that would, you know, would, would allow NPM modules to not hook into the internals of these things. It's not, uh, <laughs> it, it's definitely one of the things that, you know, I, if I could redo them in node, I, I would completely replace them from scratch or, or not, not put them into node at all. And, and none of the people who originally wrote these are all that active anymore, uh, which is also kind of a bummer. Um, and particularly for TLS, so like one of the, you know, if there's a security issue with TLS, we can fix it. Um, or if there's something else, it, it just usually takes a long time until somebody gets around to, to actually putting the work and of understanding what the code does and, and how it needs to be changed. Um, so yeah, that's not a great situation for Node to be in. Uh, right. So, so, so one of the really nice things of the last year in Node, I would say is, uh, so, <laughs> so a new, uh, collaborator joined the Node.js, uh, team, uh, he's, he's called, uh, Robert and he just put in a lot of work into, you know, figuring out how should streams actually work what changes need to be made? How can they, they be made in a way that does not break everybody? And, and those, um, of those 194 commits uh, that he has made since then, I think most of them are actually uh, all, like almost all of them are screams related, screams improvements. 
Um, and it shows that like if you if you really want to fix something um, that's possible, it just it takes a lot of work. Yeah. It it would have been nice to not have HTTP one in Node Core. Um, I I guess that was also one of the things that just made sense at the time. And I can totally see that, but it would also have been so nice to have things that can be implemented outside of Node, and that includes HTTP, um, to, to have them implemented in NPM modules. And, and yeah, so I, I mean, like there was, there is this concept that uh, Node should have a small core and lots of people are in favor of that, uh, which basically means the thing that I just said, if it can be implemented outside of Node Core, it should be. Um, but that's in practice not the way that Node.js is currently moving um, at all, I would say. Um, to me, there's always been this tension between two things that, that, that are supposedly tenants of Node. One is small core, which we see here, and the other is batteries included. And those are like those are opposites, you know, like, I mean, I don't know if they're, op well, yeah, they're opposites. I mean, I mean, batteries included means that like, you shouldn't have to go out and find a module to do fundamental things. And I do think that, you know, as much as it's a pain point for us now to have HTTP in core rather than, you know, this stuff implemented elsewhere. Um, I do think that, that having it in core was pretty important to, early adoption. So, so two things there. Yeah. Um, one, I, so I, I don't know how, how I would have felt about going the Python route, but I think that would have been something that, you know, would have alleviated the small core concern to some degree, like basically ship node and ship a bunch of packages with it, but don't put it in the binary and then develop it separately. Um, that, that is something that I could, I would have preferred that over like putting everything into into the main repo and and shipping it as part of the binary, and and for things as like HTTP two or basically the same situation with HTTP one. Um, I mean, yeah, sure. When Node was created, we didn't have things like Wasm, um, but I I kind of hope that you know that technology is uh, would be able to provide something like you know. Take this C plus plus library that does a lot of 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 HTTP two state management, and and put that into Wasm, make that usable from JavaScript, and just let that be it. No native code involved. Um, I think that's doable, and I think that would be a lot nicer than than having native code involved at all in the actual result. Hmm. Yeah. Um, obviously, that wasn't an option back in the day, but right. Uh, so yeah, the, this is the list of of all modules that are currently available from the Node.js repo directly. Uh, so basically, the list of built-in modules that are exposed by default without any flags. And and yeah, it just turns out. So like, for lots of them, there's no native code involved, and there's really no reason why they should have to be in Node Core. I mean, like we said, for HTTP, HTTP2, TLS, there's currently native code involved, but you know, it doesn't strictly have to be the case. Uh, mm. You know, there. So, so what this says is basically there's quite a lot of Node Core that doesn't really need to be in there, or where it's totally reasonable to have user land alternatives. Uh, if if you're participating in in the Node.js main repo, if you're watching the repo, you get hundreds of GitHub notifications each day. Um, and that's, that's kind of like, so that kind of makes it an all or nothing thing. You can't just like be involved casually or it's, it's hard to do so if you really want to keep up with what's going on. Right. And, and I feel like splitting that up into multiple repositories, uh, would be really nice. I, I know people are thinking about that for some, uh, items. I know I suggested it when we added async local storage, but. Unfortunately, there weren't enough people who, who agreed with me, I guess. <laughs> like one thing that I don't like about this, you know, um, is that it, it makes it difficult to implement like a low level internal API that you can build things on top of nicely. And, 
and you know have that be more well defined i i would like to see that um you know have have more modularity inside of node core itself yeah. not have every part of of node reach into every other part of node which is kind of what we are currently doing in a lot of a lot of cases yeah and in a lot of the cases the way we in the past the way we did it ended up exposing stuff to end users who then write modules that reach into right. stuff and then we can't undo it <laughs> and then there's web compat right and and that kind of like drives into the whole other direction which is basically that we are adding more things to node that that kind of feel like they should go into node core because well, we're going for web compatibility here and in browsers, they are also shipped by default as part of the browser. And mm. we're, we're fine with that basically, I think. <laughs> yeah. So, um, so yeah, these are all things that are being added or have been added. I mean, this is like a good thing. And at the same time, like it means that we end up with like multiple conflicting, like we now have two URL implementations, the old one and the web combat one. And we now have two, <laughs> two, two module implementations, the old one and the, you know, and the, and the, and the new one. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, and, um, and, and we do keep adding stuff to node core and. Right. Yeah. <laughs> oh, you're bringing me down, Anna. You're bringing me down. <laughs> do you, I don't know if you remember, but do you like know the number of deprecated APIs? I know there's over a hundred deprecation codes. I don't know if that corresponds one per API. Yeah, so so it's like just short of 150 deprecation codes for Node. <laughs> I have strong feelings about what is on that slide. <laughs> yeah. um, Node just has the purpose of being stable and not like you know breaking changes are just like something that you can't do to or thousands of Node.js developers need to update their own code. That is usually legacy code. And that makes upgrading from Node.js version to Node.js version painful in a lot of cases. And, and so keeping the number of breaking changes low is, is kind of really important to me personally as, as far as the future of Node.js is concerned. Like I, I, have, I, I feel like we've made like, like certain missteps that I mean, I'm not sure a lot of people in Node Core would agree with me that that there that there were um, that there were missteps. Actually, actually, I'd like your opinion on this one. I, to this day, think that adding error codes was a mistake. <laughs> I, I understand the motivation. I think the motivation is great, um, but we're not particularly set up to manage large sets of things like that well. And we end up with like a million far too specific ones and a bunch that are just catch-alls. And like we, we all have debates about whether the, this one or that one should be a type error or, or a regular <laughs> error. And it's like, you know, JavaScript comes with like five or six different error types and we only probably would need like three or four of them just use them in the big motivation wasn't actually to help end. Well, what in my opinion, wasn't actually to help end users as much as you could argue it helps end users to like, be able to like have an error code that they sniff for. Although I don't think it actually does in, re in practice. I think it only does in theory. Um, but the big motivation was that error codes, uh, it says we didn't have error codes. It meant that every time we changed an error message, we had to treat it as a breaking change because somebody in, 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 in the ecosystem was probably checking the text of that error message. I consider that kind, in retrospect at least, I consider that kind of friction a feature, not a bug. I don't know if anybody yeah. agrees with me, but how do you feel, Anna? <laughs> um, I, I agree with a lot of what you just said. Yeah. So, so the big thing is, yeah, our error messages, uh, our error codes are way too specific. Um, they're not specific in a way that's useful because any single me method or, or, you know, whatever, it's only gonna have like five or six errors, maybe at most that it's gonna possibly emit. You don't need to have the full list of all 
I don't know, hundreds, I guess, of error codes. It, um, what I don't like about how we did this is that the purpose was, you know, like you said, to keep people from, from uh, parsing error messages. But we kind of like didn't go all the way on that. Yeah, they're still doing it and they're gonna keep doing it. <laughs> yeah, and, and in particular because we're not providing a reason not to do that. Because for example, you know, there's error messages that are parameterized where you know there's some value that, that goes in there. And and that's not good because if we want to keep people from parsing error messages, we should make that um, we should make that information pro uh, programmatically accessible. We should put it on the error object that we're creating instead of just like <laughs> having a nice way to format don't, the error. Don't, don't give anyone ideas about making this more complicated. <laughs> I, I have had that idea and I've thought about doing a pull request, but it's also like something that that's massive change. Uh, but it's, it's one that I would, I would argue makes a lot of that sense. Then thirdly, um, the, so, so one thing that I actually believe Java is doing right um, is, is that it differentiates between, uh, you know, runtime exceptions and programmatic errors, uh, programming errors. Mm -hmm. um, and, and our error codes don't do that and that's not helpful. And then fourthly, um, you know, for programming errors, does not make any sense to put that same major restriction in place, I would say, uh, because people should not be expecting that kind of error to happen. And then fifthly, I, I feel like we have just been lacking common sense in dealing with error messages. We have been just applying the rule blindly that error message changes or error code changes are same very major and not really thinking about how people actually would use these things in practice. Oh, <laughs> want to talk about ESM. <laughs> Let's talk about ESM, ECMAScript modules. Right. So, so this slide, this is basically what everybody wants. People want to be able to require ES modules uh, with the require function and import common JS modules, like existing ecosystem system modules, just with import. And these things are not going to happen. And that kind of sucks <laughs> yeah and 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 we will for be explaining why until the end of time not, and that's not any but that's not people's yep. fault it's just the nature of yeah yeah and yep. we've gotten some flack for it not that not that long. anyway let's we'll, we'll get to the flack <laughs> <laughs> yeah um so I mean, the basic story here, as I understand it, and I know you said you agree with it, it's like, well, the JavaScript language wants to add modules because lots of people are using JavaScript in the browser and they don't really have a module system. It would, would be really nice if they did. Um, and that was kind of developed in a way that didn't work well with Node because at first the, the existing ecosystem of modules was just not really taking an account in, uh, at, that, at that point. And, and the reason how that worked out is that, you know, in browsers, you want to have, you have things like network latency that you want to think about and, and, and you don't really have that in Node where you'll just load everything from disk, which is pretty fast comparably. And, and we just like, so the way that this ended up working is Node has a synchronous module system. The web has a somewhat asynchronous module system, or at least that's the way it's kind of designed. And Node.js just, just wasn't really fast to, to, to stand up in the committee meetings and say, hey, this is incompatible. We're not going to be able to, to implement this in a way that makes um, the existing user base happy. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of how we ended up with two pretty incompatible systems. Some, some things are going well. Yeah. Um, I'm, I am really happy about this ratio. Um, it's like obviously not saying that every node contributor has about 10 commits, um, but um, it's a lot better than other open source projects. And yeah, and I know lots of these are from these spikes that you mentioned earlier when we were looking at the contribution graph, um, where we had people in a room that did their first commits. But even without that, it's um, 
it it shows that there's significant community involvement. Um, yeah, I'm yeah. happy about that. Yeah, it shows that people are invested. So an API is actually one of the things that I really do use as a module developer. I maintain a couple libraries that use an API for native add-ons. Um, and, and this screenshot is from one of these libraries from the conversion to an API. And, and I love an API. It makes writing clean code for nodes so much easier. Um, you don't have to understand all the um, idioms that you need to know when you're working with V8 uh, directly anymore. Uh, so it's it's a lot easier to write correct code, um, and it's a lot easier to just write code in C plus plus or other languages that that are then turned into native add-ons. So so just to be clear, the code on the left here it contains tons of misunderstandings about how the V8 API or its NAN wrapper works, um, <laughs> uh, because it was written before I like got into Node Core and started understanding all of these things and how to actually deal with with things properly. And and now I don't have to care about that anymore when I'm writing add-ons. That's nice. Uh, we talked about this a bit earlier with the with what we could do with HTTP HTTP one if we were to like write these from scratch now. Yeah. Um, it's it's just it's cool that you can write code in other languages and let Node run that, and you can ship it anywhere. You don't need to worry about operating systems or platform architectures or shared objects or anything like that. Uh, you can just use Node to run other languages code. I think that's awesome. That's awesome. Oh, well, let's talk about it. since, uh, yeah, since uh, Ryan will have given his talk yesterday at this point. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so, so obviously we have no idea what Ryan is going to say. Um, but if, if necessary, I think we can get into that in the Q&A. Um, the the Dano release 1.0.0 is pretty freshly out. And, and obviously, people have been talking about the future relationship of, of Node and Dano a lot. Right. But, so it, it always seems like people think that, that Dino uh, is going to split the ecosystem, that you know, and Node are going to move people in different directions. And we end up with with like uh, people who use only the one or people who use only the other and only write code for one or the other. And, and I don't think that's what's gonna happen. Um, I, yeah, I, I think, so I mean, it's, it's already showing Node.js is adding compatibility for the web API because well, people write JavaScript for the web a lot and it's really popular. I think Dino has some kind of Node.js compatibility mechanisms that they're working on. I haven't really looked into it too much, but I saw that you know they have commits of that kind in the in the Dino repo uh, on GitHub. I think they're just all going to move closer together in terms of what they can do, um, share more APIs that everybody can code for, and 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 if people are happier running that code with with Dino than with Node or vice versa, then great. I mean, whatever works for people. But what if we're wrong? <laughs> yeah. yeah. I mean, so what? Well, get a good run. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, um, like, I, like I don't think it will. I don't think I, I, you know. Like I think I think uh, you know the kill the the you know there's there's too much too much riding on you know too you know the the npm module system and things like that that you know it's going to make gonna create a lot of friction for people to switch to Dino, but they might. And they might like it better, and it might work better for them. I don't know. We'll see. So it's Q&A time. <laughs> <laughs>